I would like to uh, call the uh, June 10th uh, meeting of the Newport Beach City Council into session. And may we have a roll call, please? The record will reflect that Council Member Curry is currently absent, and he has an excused absent for the moment. Uh, we are going to move into the study session portion of the business, but begin with uh, clarification of items on the consent calendar. Uh, Councilwoman Daigle. I have none. Uh, Councilman Hen. None for me. How about Councilwoman Gardner? I have two, please. On uh, item number five, on page uh, 58, which is D1, the contingency reserve. Uh, this is the strikeout version. And it says the contingency reserve shall have a target balance of written 15%, quote, 25%. So I think that's a typo unless my math is even worse uh, than it usually is. Right? Okay, thank you. And then on item six, two questions on that. Um, just because it's listed doesn't mean it will necessarily be closed. I think uh, Mr. Mosier made a point about Back Bay Drive. We might not want to close that, but, but we have the ability to if you want to. The other thing was the question about the parking lots. Some reasons, some we will want for staging areas. Is that not correct? Isn't that one reason why we might close a, a parking yeah, lot? Because we obviously do want parking for a busy weekend. That's right. They're used for sta staging areas. Okay. Thank you. All right. Councilwoman. Uh, okay. Councilman Petros? <laughs> I have none. <laughs> uh, uh, none. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I have none. All right. We will uh, move into our first item then on the study session agenda. Second item on the study session agenda. Lido Marina Village. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Chris Miller, a Harbor Resources Manager. And um, right now we're going to be talking about Lido Marina Village and just focusing on the marina. Excuse me, Chris, just a second. Uh, I need to recuse myself from this item. I have a business relationship with a business in Via Lido Plaza. So noted. Chris? Thank you. Um, and th this afternoon, we are just going to be looking at the marina uh, reconstruction portion of Lita Marina Village. And the reason why we're bringing this to the City Council this afternoon is to um, get some direction from the Council as to how you would like us to proceed. And we'll be giving you some options at the end of the presentation, some possible options as to what we could consider and, and, and how we could go about that. We thought it would be more efficient if we could have some direction from the City Council first and then go through the Harbor Commission process. So leading off the presentation, I'd like to introduce um, Shauna Schaffner with CAA Planning, who will guide us through the first probably two-thirds of the presentation and giving us some background and some details on what it is that their client, DJM, will be proposing for the marina portion of Lido Marina Village. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Hill, members of the council. I am Shauna Schaffner, Chief Executive Officer of CAA Planning, representing DJM Capital on their waterside marina reconstruction project. Uh, I am here along with representatives from DJM Capital and some of our technical consulting team. The Lido Marina Village project site is located southeasterly of the Newport Boulevard Bridge. Uh, shown in the red outlined area. Uh, back in March, we submitted an application for an approval and concept to Harbor Resources uh, that included the reconstruction of the existing marina and public access improvements to the marina. Uh, as Chris indicated, we are seeking input from the Council prior to the Harbor Commission consideration of this project. The existing marina is a 48-slip marina, originally constructed in 1955 and in need of significant utility and infrastructure upgrades for code compliance and life safety. And here is a plan of the existing marina layout. You might uh, equate to the audience uh, with what the red line is and the black line. Uh... I will do that going forward, thank you. The proposed reconstruction uh, would be for a 47-slip marina with a significant increase in the number of small and human-powered crafts through on-dock racks. Uh, there would be new in-slip pump-outs, a water taxi berth, 
enhanced public access boardwalk, and also conceptual plan and entitlement for a new public dock. Here is an illustrative plan which shows uh, both the landside and waterside components of the project. This is a table depicting the existing and proposed boat lengths uh, of the marina. You can see that the existing marina has uh, a wide variety of slips. The proposed project will significantly enhance the number of small boat slips in the 20 to 25 foot range and also the under 38 foot range and then consolidate some of the bigger slips in the 82 and 90 foot range. This will also significantly improve the uh, or increase the number of gondolas and kayaks going from 5 to 32. Okay, here is the plan for the reconstructed marina. Uh, the plan is depicted as dock A, dock B, and dock C, and I will walk you through those components uh, now. The orange highlight that you see, which I will put up on the screen here. Chris, maybe you can use the mouse. This is the new public access boardwalk, and I will also go through that in just a moment. Dock A is really a, a small boat area. There is a, Chris, maybe you can follow me here, uh, this slips here, and then also two small boat basins, basin one and basin two, which significantly increase the number of small boats. Um, as I indicated, there will be a, a water taxi berth, which is location and also uh, on dock racks for kayaks and a low freeboard dock which will enable easy launching for kayaks. Dock B is the main yacht center. Uh, it's accessible via an 80-foot ADA gangway. Uh, actually, there are two gangways. One is an 80-foot ADA gangway. One is a 35-foot gangway. Uh, and there will be 10 boat slips for boats greater than 82 feet in length. And again, the orange part here is the public boardwalk on the land side. Dock C is uh, also accessible via an 80-foot ADA gangway. And you might have seen on the plans that there is this cross-out portion. This is not a part of the project. There is an existing marina here. Uh, the project would bypass that via an existing headwalk. And there would be uh, eight additional boat slips associated with Dock C. This project also includes the conceptual design and entitlement of a new public dock. This would represent a new point of vertical access to the water. It would be via an 80-foot ADA gangway. The dock would be 10 feet wide and 90 feet long. It is intended for transient use. Uh, we do propose an on-site sewage pump out. And as I, as I mentioned, DJM Capital intends to provide entitlement and conceptual design of the stock for the city. Now I'd like to talk about the public access boardwalk. This is the uh, land side component of the project. Currently, the public access boardwalk meanders through the sites. It picks its way through existing patios, and it's not a very inviting place for uh, members of the public. Uh, this project would include a cantilevered feature, which would provide an additional six-foot boardwalk uh, beyond the existing land area. We'll, uh, we'll go through some more detailed slides in just a moment. Here's a conceptual rendering of the boardwalk, which shows a little bit more activation of this space. Okay, and, and here's the site section of the cantilever design. The cantilever design uh, has two main goals. One is to provide an extended area for the public boardwalk. The second is to provide protection against future sea level rise. You'll see, Chris, if you can help me here. On the end here, there is a cap, which is one and a, five, one and a half feet high, uh, higher than the existing seawall, and this will help to prevent uh, against problems from future sea level rise.
Uh, this is the uh, existing terminus of the boardwalk. You can see that these areas are very constrained. Uh, we do not propose to put the boardwalk past this property because it is um, very, very limited in space. Uh, beyond that picture that I just showed you, uh, we would propose a connection for a future boardwalk which could be done in connection with the city. So this is the area of that photograph that I just depicted. And what we propose is that there could be on the water side uh, a connection here that could go across the Elks property. And I believe that Chris will talk in more detail about a future connection. But this might provide an opportunity to go from the public dock, the new public dock, across the Elks and connect through Dock A to the land side. We are seeking several approvals from the city. Uh, we are requesting an approval in concept, which would allow us to submit a coastal development permit application to the Coastal Commission. Uh, we're also asking the Harbor Commission to slightly adjust the limit lengths of the public docks, which, or not of Dock A and also the public docks, excuse me, which Chris will talk to, uh, and Harbor Commission approval for the cantilevered boardwalk. Uh, we'll also be seeking a long-term lease for the marina. That concludes my remarks, um, but I'm available along with our team should you have technical questions. And I'm going to hand it back to Chris. Thank you. Well, while you're there, <clears throat> the, uh, you, it, one of your first slides noted that the, uh, the existing marina walls were created in 55, I believe it is. And you assert that there are some structural questions about that, yet you're going to cantilever a new structure over the existing bulkhead? That is correct. Um, and Who's going to take liability if that bulkhead yeah. fails? Randy Mason, our marine engineer, is here, and he can talk to that. We have um, done a lot of work on the seawall and, and the stability of it. We are proposing a significant placement of tiebacks into the seawall uh, that would go from the water side and be anchored uh, into the land side so that we can strengthen the seawall. Um, that will require, um, again, work from the water side, but it will not require that we replace the entire seawall. It will be a significant uh, structural improvement to that wall uh, without having to replace the entire thing. Uh, are we, will the Harbor Commission get the benefit of public works review of that to, so that we can understand what the integrity of that wall is and the long-term use of it? That would be handled through our building permit process if they were to um, put in the tiebacks. And certainly the, um, the applicant um, would, would help guide us through what calculations he's, he's made to determine that the seawall is still usable. But I'll make sure that we've reviewed that and given it careful consideration. And the assumption of liability. Okay. Hmm. You? Thank you, Shauna. I will uh, continue on with the presentation and, and go into a few more details. These next couple slides talk about what I'll be asking the Harbor Commission to approve. And, and just to recap maybe what I said in the beginning of the presentation, um, rather than going to the Harbor Commission first and then coming to the City Council to um, perhaps receive different direction, we thought it would be most efficient to apprise the city council of, of what, it, what our intentions are, and then, and then um, depending on today's outcome, I would then go to the Harbor Commission and, and take the project through its normal course. But one of the things I'm going to be asking the Harbor Commission to take a look at would be the um, complexities in the, I'm going to call it the northwest corner, which is Dock A, and it's kind of where my mouse is scrolling right here. And there's some interesting things here that I, I don't really want to get into detail because it's, um, it's detailed. But um, the pier head and project lines are kind of funny in this area. They, they don't follow the normal course of, of business, per se, as they would elsewhere in the harbor. Uh, specifically, you'll notice that this projection where my mouse is going right here, technically, you would think that the pier headline would extend here and then go out something like that. And uh, we don't know why this, there's an anomaly here in this corner. 
but there is. And it's, and it's clear that the docks that are there now on that corner of Lido Marina Village, as well as the Elks Lodge, have built out way beyond that pier headline. So there's some precedence there. And um, so I think that could be solved uh, through a variance uh, with the Harbor Commission. And their proposal would be to extend their docks no further than the than the distance of the existing docks are extending out right right today, so there wouldn't be any additional space um, taken in the water. Of course, the Harbor Commission will get a much more detailed uh, explanation, but I just want to provide the overview. The next um, Harbor Commission approval required will be for the cantilevered. Uh, deck, which is really this area that I'm talking about from the bulkhead seaward, bayward out there, and that's six feet. Our rules say that cantilever decks are not permitted in um, over tidelands or, or um, um, over tidelands, or conversely, they are permitted over private waterways. And when they are permitted over private waterways, there's even a five foot uh, limit instead of the six foot limit, but this is a public serving benefit for a walkway, and um, um, we would ask the harbor commission to approve that variance so uh, aside from these two requests for variance, the project uh, fulfills the requirements of our harbor design standards and um, um, as, as it's as it 's drawn or submitted, rather. Now, to bring us back about three or four, perhaps five years or so, um, there was a study back when we were, when the city was looking at what to do with City Hall and kind of developing a master plan for this area, City Hall and Lido Marina Village. And there was a conceptual design of a, uh, a, a, of a dock and it could be a visitor-serving dock, and, and the dock runs along Lido Marina Village right here. But you can tell this feature right here, which extends out into the channel. It's well beyond the project line, well beyond where one is allowed to build a dock. This is, this is a conceptual drawing that just illustrates what possibilities could be out there for a marina that is being rebuilt after being in um, being there for fifty some odd years, now with that comes there are some complications with with this design, and I'm going to go into what those complications might be. But notably, it's building out beyond the project line, and if that were to occur, what steps would we need to um, to overcome that? So if you could just remember this this conceptual picture and doesn't uh, the, the future doesn't need to look like this but this is just an idea so these are I'm going to list four possible options that the um, that we could go from today forward one is just to allow the plan to proceed through its normal course of business and go to the Harbor Commission for review with asking for those two variances and then assuming that the Harbor Commission would approve those variances, then I would in turn, Harbor Resources would approve the approval and concept, and then the approval and concept would be taken down the regulatory permit path through the Coastal Commission, the Corps of Engineers, and the Water Board, and so on and so forth. That would be the normal course of, of business per se. So that, would, that might be an option one. And again, these are just options that I come up with. Maybe there are others that we'll, we could flush out this afternoon. Another option might be to um, allow the Harbor Commission to, to review the dock as is and maybe ask staff to staff and, and maybe the applicant to pursue an additional, we're calling it an innovative dock, and that, that's the curved dock that I was thinking of, or, or some other innovative dock that, that, might re, that we could dream of, really. And um, so allow the, the, the project to go forward, but, um, but ask staff to pursue an alternate design. And maybe that alternate design could, could be added on later to the project as a condition. 
Um, there could be a connection point. Like maybe as an example, perhaps this finger right here, it could have a connection point for, for an additional dock attached to it in the future. Any combination? Um, unless it's just, just thinking historically, um, unless it's right there initially in the initial design, that usually doesn't work well. I'm thinking of the public access dock at the across from um, 333 that was added as an afterthought and has never worked well because of that. So I think we really need to be very careful about add-ons. Okay. Uh, and and then the other point being, are you going to discuss about if we is, exceed the project line, what some of the regulatory hurdles are? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to touch upon that. Can I ask as far as exceeding that property, um, that um, project line, exceeding those various mm -hmm. lines, what is the purpose? Does it sort of maximize the number of slips or what's driving that? Uh... Well, I, um, I believe the conceptual design that was put forth four or five years ago it, it, with a vision for, the, um, for that area would be to build an iconic-looking dock perhaps a visitor serving dock some had imagined for larger boats or not maybe it's a maybe it's a maybe it's an area for just larger boats in the in in a in a private marina capacity um, but it's an opportunity for us perhaps to look outside of the box and to think big and um, because it's not often that this marina gets rebuilt every 50 years. So that's really, that's really why we're here is to say, is to ask, is it worth it to pursue into something different or not? Another possible <clears throat> option might be to approve, um, kind of divide the project into thirds and perhaps only approve sections dock A and dock C and leave dock B out of the picture, and you wouldn't leave a blank space right there. You would, they would probably opt to leave the existing slips there. It should be known that, that Lido Marina Village, um, from, a, from a dock perspective, a marina perspective, Harbor Resources is, is excited that there are plans to rebuild the marina because it, it, it does need some rehabilitation. It's, it's an old system. So um, to keep to keep the existing dock B, section B, in place for X amount of years, um, well, that might be a challenge. But that would, yeah, and then also you don't get the connection of the, the full boardwalk, is that correct? Or did the boardwalk not extend there, the proposed boardwalk? That's actually a very good point. Um, I hadn't thought of it, and perhaps the applicant might have an answer, but I'm not sure how the boardwalk would tie in if there was, if the dock, if dock B was uh, remained for X amount of years. Yeah. yeah, very good point. And perhaps option four, there could be others, might be just to um, put a stop on, on, just put a stop on the project and investigate what it would take if the council decided, um, directed staff to investigate what, a what an out-of-the-box type dock might look like and um, just put a stop on the project going forward for X amount of months or, or years or what have you while we try and figure out what, what to do. And these options right here are summarized. The question was asked, well, why does the project line exist and what is it there for and um, what are the repercussions of building out beyond that and so on and so forth? The project line is a federal line as well. Th there's the bulkhead line, the pierhead line, the project line, and those are federal lines, federally established lines. The local core office, Corps of Engineers office, has told me that if the city council wanted to change the bulkhead and the pierhead line, we could do so at a local level with the LA District Corps' help and with little ease, or little difficulty rather, um, we could we could adjust the bulkhead and pierhead line, but when it comes to the bulkhead or the project line, the project line denotes where the Corps of Engineers, the federal government, is responsible for dredging. So in our last Lower Bay dredging project a couple years ago, they dredged from project line to project line in the main channel. So. Anything that protruded into that project line centered 
navigational channel area, they said, Chris, would you like to have that area dredged where this boat is encroaching into the federal channel? And I said, yes, please. And they said, well, you need to move the boat if that's the case. So I had to work with some residents, on, uh, particularly on Lido Sud, and their boats were extending out into beyond the project line, which is okay. So my, my point is I believe that one of the main reasons why the project line exists is because it denotes where the, the federal government, Corps of Engineers, is responsible for dredging. I would, I would guess that if, if we decided to build an out-of-the-box dock outside of the project line or beyond the project line, the Corps of Engineers might, might, might approve it, and they might say, yet they might say, um, we're not responsible for dredging in this area. Now, being a federal line, there's the answer of how this gets approved or changed. And that's an answer, or that's a question that we've been asking ourselves for many years. And I don't think we have the exact answer. Well, I have asked the Corps of Engineers, and they said it would take congressional approval. And that's, that's the, the answer that I've received. I haven't um, dug deeper than that. But I think it warrants digging much deeper. And, um, but, but beyond saying that it needs congressional approval to change the project line, um, that's all I know at this point. How that gets done and what hurdles there are to get to that stage are, are to be determined. That's from a federal perspective. So when you talk about federal, you would think about the Coast Guard having jurisdiction over the waters, the Corps of Engineers. And, um, but then we also have our state regulators, um, particularly the, the, the Coastal Commission. And that may be the most challenging uh, issue right there or, or agency to work with right there. Um, I'm, I'm looking at these four options, and I don't see four options at all at least personally. I mean, w number four, we have an area that everybody agrees needs tons of work, and we have a developer who is eager to get in and do it, and we're going to say, well, you know what? We think you should wait a few months, maybe a couple of years while we think about it. Eh, well, that's the end of that. They're going to find something else to do with their money. Um, number three, I think the big problem there is, again, um, we're going to lose something there like the boardwalk because they're not going to come back later, I'm sure, and say, well, when you finally make up your mind what you want to do with B, we'll be so happy to come in and, and do something else. Um, that was a, the, the, the conceptual plan was just that, a concept. And I think that it involves so many problems that what we have here seems to me, I, I'm, not on, I'm not a harbor commissioner, I would be very interested in what they say, but it brings in more uh, kayak use, a lot of small boat use, as well as accommodating, I, I think, what is there now in terms of, of large boats and even adding some. I, I just, I'd just go with number one myself. Mr. Mayor. Mm. Councilman Selig. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I'd take a different approach to it, uh, Councilman Gardner. We spent a lot of time and effort on the Lido Marina Village plan, and um, you know, we did come up with the, with the concept plan, and... Um, you know, to my mind, when we, when we worked on it, that we were going to look at going outside the project line, doing whatever would be necessary to uh, come up with the design. I think the, the applicant here has done a good job of dealing with the, with the redesign within the constraints of the, pro of the project line. But um, to me, we're going to be doing something that's going to be lasting here for a couple of generations and it's the one opportunity we have in the harbor to do something really dynamic and creative, um, something along the line of the Slido Marina Village plan. So to me, taking six months, four months, whatever it would be, uh, and pursuing option number four and seeing if we can come up with a creative plan and, um, and also find out what more is involved in going outside this uh, project line. I'm getting a lot of mixed uh, mixed signals on what's required there, whether we have to go to Congress, where, whether we don't, whether we can do it with just getting an easement from the core. Um, so I'm not, really, I'm not really confident in all the information that we've received to date on this. And to me, it just seems it would just be 
you know, we're talking about building something. When this gets built, it's going to be here for a long time. So taking a few months to uh, explore this a little bit further, um, you know, I don't think uh, is a wasted effort at all. And maybe we could come up with something that uh, would be creative and it could be phased in, that you could do one phase inside the project line and one outside the line. I don't know. Um, I just don't think it's been explored enough because the property owner has accepted the project line as a constraint and hasn't um, chosen to go, uh, to go beyond that. Um, just some other concerns that, uh, that I have. I like the, the fact that they recognized the, the opportunity to go around the Elks Lodge and connect the public uh, dock to uh, Lido Marina Village. Um, the, uh, I'm not sure how, the, how this connects up at the other end of the property with the, uh, with the Conrad and the, and the Olin property because there's a walkway that goes all the way to the end there, so I'd want to make sure that that occurred. And um, again, all these you know these pier head and, and project lines are very very confusing issues, and uh, we never seem to get uh, finite information on, on how to deal with them. And, and I think we need to get that information. And to me, spending six months, he's not going to go away in six months. These projects, these these docks will be fine for six months. And let's see if we can find a better plan here. Who's paying for it? I, I mean, uh, what the study? No, I'm thinking that, and I may just not understand this. I'm. I was thinking that the the developer is paying for the marina. Yes. Well, <laughs> that's sort of hutzpah, isn't it? To say we're going to go from this kind, we're going to have you. We want, you know, this this landmark marina, and you get to pay whatever umpty um million dollars more for it. Wow. Well, we're the we're the we're the trustees of these public trust lands, and uh, he's the he's the lessee. It's no different than if I own a piece of land and I want to lease it to you and uh, uh, give you some criteria on how to uh, how to build your project. Uh, the Irvine Company, for example, does that all the time on the land they lease all over the city. It's one of the reasons why we have such good development. So I see nothing unusual about that whatsoever. <clears throat> Councilman Gardner, I would add that. Uh <clears throat> that uh, zoning, in fact, tells people what they can do with their land. And um, we're dealing with tidelands here. Uh, the community put a year into a master plan of, of looking at the rejuvenation of all of the Lido Village complex area. And part of that master plan was a world-class harbor. And, um, and I guess the consensus that everyone I've heard talk about uh, believes in uh, is that Whatever is going to happen is only going to happen once. And the uh, concept of, of, of add-on uh, has not been an active, positive concept in the history of the city. Uh, although I do think that, that, once again, just as you develop a master plan, if we had a master plan for a docking system, and part of that master plan fell within the boundaries that uh, we can do locally, uh, and part of that master plan was outside, and that could be phased in that sense if that might be an approach that we would look at. The bottom line is the economics. I think a more exciting harbor would draw more uh, uh, visiting, yachting community to it. I think it would draw a higher revenue to it, uh, and it has to work economically. And, and therefore, if, if we want a world-class harbor, it may be that we have to roll the rent in softer on the lease, uh, it may be that, that we have to make some other kinds of concessions so that the developer can make a profit off it because the developer is not going to do anything if they can't make a profit off it. But in fact, this is our land. It's on an annual lease basis, and we have the right to decide what we would like to do with it. But the issue is, is we're only going to get that right once. And uh, this is our 50-year turn. And, uh, and so is, are we willing to accept this, or would we like to make sure that we're making the best decision uh, for the long-term benefit of the community in the harbor. And that's the question that's before us today. Obviously, I think we have. So. Um, Mr. Mayor? Oh. Yes. Are you still uh, down here? Yeah, I know. It's a little bit uh, <laughs> not much company today. Uh, yeah, surely if you make a miscalculation with some things, you can take corrective action, but you miscalculate something like this, it's just with you forever. Uh, so... Uh, when does the economic input um, come into the process as far as um, 
uh, leases and all that. I mean, clearly, you know, the city is looking to optimize its revenue. That's our responsibility to do that. So is there going to be a council committee, or how are we going to go about doing that? Well, uh, currently um, we are negotiating leases, implementing leases, with all the commercial properties, marinas, in the harbor. Um, and our community development department is working on that. I don't know how if they've started the process with Lido Marina Village yet, but I know that that process is underway for the harbor as a whole. So the planning department is negotiating leases with? That's where our income properties manager resides. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Who is that? Uh, Lauren Wooding. Okay. I, I, I have a couple more slides here um, I can quickly go through. This just talks away. It talks about um, the public access at the Elks Lodge. The Elks Lodge is, are these three, this is a double slip, so we'll call it three or four slips right here. And um, Lido Marina Village, DJM, is proposing their public walkway. I think it would end somewhere around this neighborhood right here. And, um, but I think eventually some forward planning or some vision might be to have a public walkway in front, in front of the Elks Lodge and connecting, uh, uh, pardon me, um, right here to our public dock. How that happens is to be determined and probably another discussion at a, at a separate council meeting. But um, I think it's important to note that if Lido Marina Village would have a, a long walkway and then it would be interrupted by 60, 90 feet of nothing and then the walkway would resume, it would be nice to have a continuous walkway. Um, I also wanted to just comment briefly on the public dock at Central Avenue. Let's see, where's my mouse? Here's my mouse. This is Central Avenue right here, which is a public street end. And um, we think this would be an ideal location for a public dock. I think it's uh, about 90 feet long and um, can accommodate boats such as Duffy-sized boats or others. And the point would be that um, finally we would have a public access point on this, in this part of the harbor to go to this area that is being revitalized in Lido Marina Village. And um, the applicant is proposing... Um, to get the entitlement for this and do the engineering. Um, who constructs and who pays for the construction ultimately would, would be something the council would, would want to work with. Um, on, a, on, a, on a minor note, which we can definitely um, talk about later, of course, but I think it's worth bringing up is the um, sewage pump out station here. And the, the reason that the applicant is choosing for the sewage pump out station here, one of the reasons I should say, is because there are grants available through the California, um, through the state parks division for reimbursement if you build a dock with a, with a pump out station there. I'm, I'm very much for pump out stations. I think they're good throughout the harbor, but I will admit that to maintain the city's five pump out stations is um, extremely challenging. In fact, I'm, I'm going to be having a meeting here soon with the with, uh, public works director on that very topic because, um, it, believe it or not, it's not as easy as it would sound. With that said, there is also kind of a, uh, a question that might need to be answered is if we're inviting, if we have a destination-style dock, destination, people going there to go specifically to dinner and so on and so forth, would we want a pump out station there? So that's a question that we would have to ask ourselves. And, and that's my last slide. That's on Petros, <clears throat> Mayor Hill. Um, can we see the slide of the, the whole plan again? Mm -hmm. My, uh, First of all, Chris, on, on the notion of those, the, the project line and the, uh, the turn at the corner there, would any of this discussion threaten the ability to maintain the existing docks there through another agency? Could the Coastal Commission come back in or, or the Corps or anybody and say, hey, if you want to do any of this, remove those existing docks at the edge? 
I suppose that's a possibility, but I would I would hope that the applicant and, and myself are are putting our bets on that if we are sticking to not the f exist not the same as the existing footprint, but not extending any further out than the existing docks do, mm -hmm. that we would be allowed to do that. But certainly that's a good question, <clears throat> and we're going to have to roll the dice a little bit on that one. Uh, you know that my professional career is in planning and engineering, and I have never once asked a question of a state or federal agency and gotten a straight answer in four to six months. So to think that we're going to be able to find a resolution of this and get a square answer in that kind of horizon, it won't happen. Let's just be honest about that. In fact, the only time that we'll ever get a straight answer from a permitting authority is once an application is filed and we do that dance that we do and we finally arrive at whatever that answer is. So I don't think that option four is something that is realistic unless we agree that we're going to take a couple of years to do this and submit an application. I swim. I don't yacht. So I'm, I'm, I'm coming at this from a, a different perspective. Um, and, I, and I'm sorry, I don't have the benefit of uh, the discussion that led to Alternative 5B. But what I see in 5B is a projection of a, a use intended for a single user into the bay that is there for all users. And it seems that it's taking up more space uh, on an area that really doesn't provide any more benefit to the yachting public. Now, I could be wrong. Again, I admit I'm not a, a, a boatsman. I don't even know if that's a proper term. Um, I've been to San Tropez, a world-class harbor. I've been to Cannes. I've been you know, around Europe and been to a number of these locations, and they are all landside marinas where you tie up. In fact, one of the most beautiful uh, wooden boat displays I've ever seen was at San Tropez, and that's a, a, a landside, world-class uh, facility. I just think there's, there's for, for my liking, there is too much uncertainty with this concept, and that should the concept have been advanced, there should have been more questions answered at the time the concept was proposed to see if it was really something that was, that, that was possible. I'm lacking any more discussion, and I'm, I'm interested to hear what my colleagues continue to say, but I'm kind of leaning with uh, Council Member Gardner on this. Let me uh, react a bit. Uh, I was involved around the periphery of the uh, evolution of the, of the plan. And I think the goal was very clear that there was a, an absolute belief that the decline of Lido Village in part was done, which took place when the big party boats came in and backed into the boardwalk and closed down the environment and, and uh, the fumes and the lack of view and, and this type of thing made it less desirable to be out there. And, and, and then the lack of maintenance from previous owners over the years and it just continued to decay. Uh, the goal, I think, was to open up Lido Village uh, and to allow it to have access visually to the bay once again because it lost its vision of the bay. At the same time, to house boats in a marina style uh, and to house boats off of boats of visitation slips uh, for short-term visitors uh, and this type of thing at a port location of where there was things to do. There was entertainment, there was restaurants, um, hospitality type of, of activities. So they wanted to, to meet that need of, of giving more of a vista, making the, the, the upland land more valuable in its relationship to the bay and still housing a, a nice environment for yachting. The second thing was connectivity. And that was to bring, and the talk was, is from the 32nd of from the intersection of 32nd Street and Newport Boulevard, connectivity to walk to the bay and, and have that be a nice entrance to the bay, have it be a, a port of itself, if you will, of a destination to come to the water and then have a promenade along the water. So the master plan, as you look at that, you'll see there were two of those nodes, one where you would come between the buildings and come out to the, to the harbor itself 
and then come along and then a second node that would go out to the main mooring particular areas. But those mooring areas, once again, were pulled off. Lots of room for, for uh, like I call, Lear boats. <laughs> and um, uh, and uh, and in the larger boats uh, around the inside part of the uh, of the harbor, um, the important part is that connectivity going down and going past the Elks Club uh, to the uh, uh, Newport Bridge over the harbor, where we would build a pedestrian bridge that would then go across and connect Mariner's Mile, so that we would create a walkable environment around the harbor that uh, visitors could come uh, and enjoy. And, and that was, in fact, I think, the intent of the master plan uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was done. Uh, what I see, well, and, and then to make it uniquely Newport Beach, uh, the dilemma that I see in front of us is that I think that, that everyone, myself included, want to see us to move ahead. Uh, we have waited a long time to have this uh, property improved. Uh, we have that opportunity now. We just want to make sure that we have not missed something, that we have thought of everything. And and I would ask staff, uh, and I think it was your second alternative, uh, but but is there a way of of, of, of double tracking this? Is there a way of, of moving ahead? I mean, this plan has evolved from the developer's uh, design uh, and you know, given the constraints of the existing parameters, it's a good plan. It's better than, than what we have. But is it the best plan that we could have? And, um, and is it possible? I mean, since, I mean, our processes are not overnight, um, could we begin uh, going through the Harbor Commission? Could we begin looking at that and, and at the same time fast-tracking that? And, and maybe we, the city, have to go out and, and find a marine designer. And, you know, I mean, I can't believe that we could not find a marine designer in 45 days have three different concepts to look at uh, that we could evaluate and compare to what's processing being processed through the Harbor Commission. We can always stop that process at any point in time if we suddenly wake up and find, wow, this can be done. At the same time, if we look at these things and we say they're all, you know, they're all pipe dreams, they're just not possible, either not possible through federal uh, regulation or not possible or realistic through Coastal Commission, then we're off of that wagon and we've answered the question. We have come upon the solution that's the best that we can achieve. To me, it's how do I balance those elements. I want to move ahead, but I want to make sure I didn't leave something that uh, I regret later on. Well, I don't know. We haven't, I don't know how Leslie feels, but uh, at least on this end of the, of the, we have a, quite a split. So one of my suggestion would be I don't think anything should happen based on a study session with a split council, and perhaps something like this should be agendized, and we take a formal vote, and we'll have Keith back. Michael will have to recuse himself anyway. But we will have a, a clear decision on which way we want to go before we spend money and time on either of them, and that would give the um, developer a much a greater sense of uh, firmness on proceeding. Councilwoman Daigle. Um, what's the pleasure of staff? I mean, when I listen to your presentation, you seem to be kind of saying there's really no harm in exploring some things and getting some more ideas. I mean, did I, was I listening accurately or? Well, I'll give a, I'll give a very square on the fence uh, answer to that. Um, as, as staff, I'm, I'm very happy that the marina is up for, um, re for reconstruction. We've been looking at this marina for such a long time, and it's been patchworked, repaired, and kept up and kept afloat for many, many years. I've worked with, I can think specifically of three different owners, it seems, it seems like, perhaps more, I'm not positive, over the past 10 or 12 years, who've had visions for what the marina could look like. And so when, when this applicant came and said, um, here's our plan, will you approve? It was, it was exciting from that perspective. On the other hand, I think it's, um, there, there is room in that turning basin. Um, we've, we've proven that recently with the um, two yachts that visited us. One um, just about three weeks ago stayed for a weekend, and then the Invictus was here for a series of weekends last fall. 
So of, uh, of all places, that official turning basin is large enough to where something out of the box, it could handle it from a space perspective. Um, the big question in my mind is, I, sh I really don't know what it would take from a regulatory process um, to go forward with a concept without getting the right people to help us with that decision. I, that's, so I guess, I don't know if that really answers your question. Well, but, well let me uh, ask you, let me start to narrow down a couple things. In terms of the regulatory part, we have a lobbyist, right, Jim Crum. I think he's still on retainer. Uh, he's not a retainer right now. We okay. could re-retain him. Sure. So we, we have re a resource that could help us figure those things out. Um, and then what about the mayor's idea that you that the city um, hires uh, some sort of – I mean, it is our property. That's an important prop, uh, point. It is our property. It is our community. So we do have some standing to um, get other – solicit other ideas as well. So what do you think about – a process where there is more ideas that come flow forward than limited to um, what our professional staff and the applicant would sort of hash out together. Well, I think I think always getting more opinions is is a good idea. Without, but on the same side, I'd like to be respectful to the applicant and the hard work that they've put into coming up with the design. So it's, um, I w it would be interesting to see what other out of the box thinking there there could be. And maybe that would be uh, 30, 45 days that we wouldn't feel in the long run. Um, but again, from, a, from an approval standpoint, I, I have to respect the design and the hard work that they have put into it. I'm not advocating it. I'm just um, working with the application that's been presented to me. Okay. Well, I, I'm in the camp that more information and more time is to our benefit, not to our detriment. Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, just uh, I think you pretty well re responded to Councilman uh, Petros's comments, but I just say a couple of things. One, I don't expect to get an answer in, in four months. However, I do expect that we will have more knowledge of what the process is than we do now. I feel very uncomfortable with uh, with the kind of information that we have now, and um, I know that the applicant's consultant has given him information on how long it would take. I don't know whether that's correct or not. I'd like to have some of that verified. I know that I had a conversation with with Chris today, and I found out there's a federal channel on the East Coast where you don't have to move the project line to do structures. You go in and get an easement from the Corps of Engineers. Is that applicable here? I don't know. But I think those are some of the things we need to find out. So I think we need to, uh, you know, I don't, you know, the mayor's suggestion is fine with me, just so we can, you know, start finding out some more information here and make sure that we're doing the best plan because uh, what we're doing here is going to be here for a couple of generations, and I'd like to make sure we get it right this time. We've spent a lot of time and effort on the Salido Marina Village plan, and we've seen a lot of the opportunities go away. If you look at components of the plan that we had a, a lot of stuff that was going to happen in Lido Marina Village. The new owner has decided not to do that. I completely understand why and don't, I, I don't have any problems with his decision there. But, again, that's an element that's gone. Um, the, the city hall site has changed. The, the constraints of the property, the uh, Via Lido Plaza between us and Lido Marina Village has changed. I mean, so, you know, we, we, you know, we really need to decide whether we want to keep trying to move ahead on this plan or not. And I think there's still some good elements here that we need to be uh, trying to save, and this is one of them. So to me, taking a few months to do it uh, um, is, is a worthwhile investment. So does that give you clear direction? Actually, I think in light of, of what I've heard, it probably might make sense to agendize this for an actual vote with direction with uh, Mr. Curry here. Um, and that way, because it, that way you can give us very clear direction. We can maybe fill in some pieces between now and then, but we'll try and bring it back to you as soon as possible to not stall anyone else. Everyone comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone from the public who would like to comment on this item? Seeing no one, we will move on to our next agenda item. I have it. Staff, Andrew. like, oh, I'm sorry. Mayor Hill, if, if yes. we might address you again, uh, just briefly. Uh, Chris, could you please pull up slide 32? Uh, it's 
very important for us that uh, the council understands we did not shirk our responsibilities with respect to planning efforts and alternative 5B. Uh, we did look at alternative 5B in great detail. And if I could call your attention to the last paragraph of this letter from March, uh, written by URS of Randy Mason, I will read it. It says, we acknowledge that alternative 5B is not an engineering drawing. However, it appears that the proposed docks extend approximately 200 feet beyond the current bulkhead and purehead limit lines and approximately 100 feet at the south end. Such an intrusion would not be allowed under the current city or federal policy. We estimate an 8 to 12 year process requiring changes. Next slide, please that only the federal government could implement with no guarantee of success. This does not take into account the California Coastal Commission review of such a project, which would present additional challenges. We looked at this plan in great detail, uh, along with our marine engineer, and felt that it was not a plan that could be implemented. This does not have many of the uh, public benefits that the Coastal Commission likes to see. Uh, Randy Mason is here and can talk to the technical challenges of adjusting the federal project line, which Chris referenced would take an act of Congress at this point in time. Um, I would also like to ask Lindsay Parton to address the council briefly so that he can um, speak to you from the owner perspective. Uh, thank you, Mayor Harrell and uh, council. Um, as you know, my company, DJM, is the new owner of, of Lido Marina Village. And as the new owner, um, we want to be a cooperative owner of Lido Marina. Um, uh, it's not that we're trying to push something that uh, uh, we don't think is good for the city of Newport Beach uh, that's good for Lido Marina. Having said that, um, the, the focus of of us is not only on the marina, but the impact that the marina has on the retail and the whole village that we're in the process of renovating at the moment. Um, without a direction on a marina, every tenant that we are talking to today wants to know what's happening with that marina. You know, we're presenting a plan that we think is the best solution for something that I can get done in my lifetime. Uh, and that's why we're going down this road. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really... Uh, we have, I, I can't tell you the phone calls that we're getting in support of what we're doing, but people really want, the community really wants Marina Village to get, Lido Marina Village to get fixed now, not five years or ten years from now. And it's very, very difficult for me to try and fix the retail without having an immediate fix for the marina. And, you know, we're, uh, we're poised right now, as you've seen, we've already started the construction of the uh, uh, you've got an owner that's that's ready, able, and willing to fix the village as we're in the process of doing. And if I had approval on the marina today, we are prepared to spend the it's uh, five or six million dollars that we're prepared to spend on the marina. We're prepared to spend it right now. Uh, you put me in a very difficult position by by and I and I'm happy if you want to if you want to wait a, a month or, month or two to look at some other options. I think that's fine if you want more information, but we're really not interested in something that has to go through a federal process in a long, long delay. But, but if it will make you more comfortable to, to look at some other things, we're happy to do that. I quite frankly think a lot of time and energy, we've probably got six months into this plan with a lot of input from a lot of people, but if the council is more comfortable with, with more input of some other consultants or whatever it is, we're happy to accommodate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Can I ask, uh, Chris, this next item, um, how long do you think it's going to take? The, we're backing up. Um, let's give it 15 to 20 minutes. Is that right? <laughs> we can make it. I don't know. Maybe, Mayor, if you could ask who's here on each item. I, we have the sand district presentation that I know we wanted the public to hear before too much got rolling. We might be able to squeeze both in. How many are here by show of hand on the, the uh, multi, multiple vessel mooring system? And uh, the sand district? Okay, <laughs> I guess then, Chris, if we could keep it to the okay. best the 15, 20 minutes. Our best. Keep the same order. I apologize, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll move ahead with uh, study session item number three, please. Okay, I will quickly jump ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, 
I am here with Harbor Commissioner Brad Avery, who will give most of the presentation this afternoon. Um, the clicker, Brad, is right over to, is right over to the right here on the table. Other table. And press the right for, um, button. And um, the well, Brad, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Mr. Mayor, Council, thank you. Uh, uh, Mayor Hill asked uh, the Harbor Commission to uh, look into this uh, pretty interesting concept of bringing uh, the mooring boat, the moored boats together and create more water space. And really the first purpose would be to create more value for the uh, mooring permittees. And so just a quick review. Um, there are currently 558 offshore moorings in the harbor in 11 fields. And that doesn't account, the county has one field off Bay Shores and the Yacht Clubs have two other fields. So we're talking about 558 moorings in terms of the overview of the number of moorings uh, for big boats in Newport Harbor. And for five decades, they've been a source of low cost uh, uh, berthing for vessels in the harbor. And that's been quite a tra tradition in this harbor. Uh, and uh, we've been asked to look into a pilot program that would bring uh, a dock in where people could tie up their boats to a dock rather than try to tie up to mooring cans, which is uh, quite a bit more difficult in uh, the estimation of some people, and other people think it's not that big a deal. But it's been tried on a very limited basis by the two yacht clubs in town, Balboa Yacht Club and Newport Harbor Yacht Club, and that photo uh, on the left, as you're looking at it, are t four Harbor 20s on a, about a 40-foot uh, float, and that's worked out well at the clubs uh, at Newport Harbor for a couple of years now. So uh, Mayor Hill tasked us to study the multiple vessel mooring system in the double point mooring areas and return to council with the recommended pilot program, and that's what I'm doing tonight. So uh, the purpose of the program is to provide amenities to the mooring community by making it easy, an easier way to moor a vessel and also uh, sort of a byproduct of this would be uh, uh, easier to do some maintenance on the boats. So instead, again, instead of picking up a, a line in the water, you'd actually come up to a dock, be able to step off and tie your boat up just like you would in a conventional marina. Uh, and a byproduct of this also, uh, and this is what really got it rolling, is to be able to shrink the mooring fields down. And this is pretty compelling. Uh, this is off, you can, as you all know, that's Bay Island at the top there. And you look at, at, the, very, at the top photo, that's the Bay Island uh, mooring field. And then below is an image of what would happen if we put single docks in and two boats tied up to one dock. So you're ba basically taking, you're reducing the number of moorings, if you will, by half by having one 50-foot by 6-foot float or less. Uh, and then two boats come along either side of it, and they share it together. And this, of course, provides uh, a lot more water for all harbor users. Uh, and uh, the downsides might be for some of the mooring old, uh, holders, and we've heard from a lot of them, they, uh, some like the idea, and they like the idea of the convenience of the dock and the, perhaps the safety of the dock. Um, others, uh, they've really enjoyed their water around them. They're on individual moorings. There's 20 feet of water on each side, depending and they really enjoy that. They're also leery of something that comes along that will greatly uh, or significantly increase the cost to them. So here's another dramatic description uh, showing the, the largest field in the city, H and J rows, spread out between Lido Island and the peninsula, and now they're all brought together uh, at, on the docks, and it probably add, you know, you're, you're adding a tremendous amount more space for users for sailboat racers, kayakers, the whole group. You know, the moorings really aren't navigable water. Although boats go through them, they, they really shouldn't. And they cause damage when they go through. Um, they, mis, they, they misjudge things. So uh, to provide more water is a great idea. Concentrate the field. Those are, those are good ideas. But they're not without uh, some cost to, the existing, uh, to some of the existing mooring uh, permittees. Here's the uh, right off of Chris's office between Balboa Island and uh, the mainland, that north uh, Balboa Island channel, which is already fairly narrow. And you can see up top, it it does get narrow in places when you're navigating around. Uh, this would make it quite a bit more open. 
So to start this, we, we wanted to start and reach out uh, because we do have some, uh, some stakeholders that have considerable interest. As you know, we have a per permits in the harbor for people to live on their moorings, and a number of people do. And there, of course, uh, a lot of people uh, go out and enjoy their boats on the moorings. So to uh, hear from all constituents, uh, we had uh, our ad hoc committee, which consisted of myself and uh, uh, Harbor Commissioner Duncan McIntosh. We had uh, five outreach meetings, and we also had this subject brought up at our Harbor Commission meetings. And those meetings were pretty well attended. We'd have uh, 15 people in the room, and uh, many of them from the Newport Harbor uh, from the uh, Newport Mooring Association. How many moorings are there? 558 total okay. in the harbor in, in 11 fields. Uh, so in this, we're really talking about the trial now, and the idea would be to come up with a, a number of docks, put them in the water, and have people just have them try them, have them see it, and try to show people uh, and discover whether the mooring permittees and other users, visitors, would consider it a benefit to have these to be able to use these docks as opposed to use the conventional mooring uh, two cans and a line system. So uh, to do this, uh, we decided no pilings, uh, too permanent for the project. Um, there's, they provide, uh, we think if you went and eventually went to opening the program up to more, uh, more docks, you're, you're going to have a different view shed with a lot of pilings around. Um, the Newport Mooring Association suggested they would, uh, they basically were uh, not real supportive of the concept of putting all the boats together, uh, closer together in a dock program, but they did express a need to uh, have a wash down float, more wash down areas for their boats. And again, to, to refresh, the, the start of this was to provide more services for the existing mooring uh, permittees. So we took that suggestion under consideration, um, and we'll look at that a little stronger through the Harbor Commission. Uh, the legal concerns from the standpoint, the city is going to build these trial docks, six of them perhaps, and the city would own the dock, and so obviously they have to be engineered and, struct and set up so we know they're going to be safe and to hold the boats well in all weather conditions. Uh, we considered in this trial run whether to have electricity and, and water out on the docks, and uh, right away came up that it's just for this pilot program, probably too complex. Uh, many of the mooring uh, owners attending let us know that while they would like to have, if they could have a choice, they would prefer to have water on the, at, access to water on their dock as opposed to electricity. And most of them are pretty well set up with solar and onboard generators to handle their electricity. So water was more valued in terms of having something out on the docks. But for the purpose of this trial run, we were, we're recommending uh, neither to uh, get it rolling. And so we, uh, through the ad hoc committee, came up with an idea of uh, some locations for these and allowing participants in the current lessees to uh, participate and use them. So no char at no charge, uh, permittees continue paying the normal annual mooring permit fee, and uh, their mooring equipment would be taken off out of the water and stored ashore. And one of the key things is that uh, two permittees adjacent to each other would need to agree to share the dock. And neighbors being neighbors, you know, there might be some issues there. So one might want to do it, one might not. But so far we've heard from perhaps as many as 10, 10 uh, mooring holders that they would be interested in participating in a pilot project. And so the C, D, and H fields uh, the commission determined would be uh, good places to uh, put some trial docks in. The C field, which the city owns three moorings there, that would be an ideal spot for, for the moorings to be available to visitors to the harbor to use instead of picking up a mooring line to be able to tie up to a dock. We'd also to be able to get uh, feedback from them, from them, of course. So to hold these docks in position, uh, on the face of it, it's easy. You just use the existing method we have now, which is just uh, a heavy weight on the bottom with chain or uh, to keep them more, more stable so they don't move, so you could bring the docks closer together because that's eventually how we'll have to really make this work is that the, uh, the docks are held in a much more, have much more closer tolerance to drifting sideways or backwards or forwards. And that can be done and has been done in many areas around the world with the helix anchor system and a uh, uh, hybrid uh, 
combination of weights or anchor in the bottom of the bay. And so this shows you with two boats tied up to a float, pretty simple. And then the standard mooring that we're using now, holding that float together. That float, though, would be, be, could go back and forth uh, 10 feet on either side, depending on the wind, so you'd have to have greater space between them. This is a diagram of sort of something that's relatively new, uh, the C-flex system into uh, anchors that are literally screwed into the bottom, basically like a helicoil. And they are basically, they have bands on each one, and they allow the dock to rise and fall with the tide and not move much at all. So it stays in the same place but is able to go up and down with the tide. So this would allow you to compact the mooring fields. This is a diagram of that, not too descriptive, but you can see the field there with the boats pretty tight. Boats still have enough room to maneuver and tie up. And these are some places in Connecticut uh, with the floats, and they've been tried in many areas in Europe and on the East Coast. And the Newport Mooring Association put out on their website a, uh, a survey, and they, to the questions you can see right there, do you want floating docks? 61 responses, 85% negative. Would you prefer your mooring for a pilot program? Would you volunteer your mooring for a pri pilot program? 11 said yes. What are the top priorities for mooring permittees? Top priority, shoreside work dock, charge batteries overnight, light work mechanic, that kind of thing. It's important to understand the Newport Mooring Association represents approximately 50% of all mooring holders, permittees. So we haven't heard of, uh, we haven't put out a general survey to, to everyone. So the city has not performed a survey, and uh, the Harbor Commission recommends doing that um, probably during the, Ideally, during this, the, uh, if we went on ahead with a pilot program, maybe let that roll for a year and then put a survey out. Once people see it, kind of take a look. We have people using it. People are talking. Get a better idea uh, of uh, people's perception of whether that really adds value to being, to being a mooring permittee if they're able to uh, use a dock. And uh, we've come up with this uh, program. Install six more or less per council direction. 40 to 50 feet long, 6 feet wide. That's per um, engineer's recommendation. And uh, go out to bid, performance specs for any type of float. And have three floats using uh, normal buoy weight and chain method and three floats using the newer Heliflex anchor and C-flex band method or hybrid to uh, keep the, the floats close together. And that would really help us see just how close we could have these floats together to get some idea of how much we could shrink the mooring fields. Uh, and obviously the floats become beautiful homes for sea lions if we don't do something to deter them. So that's part of this as well. And I'll have to be uh, frank, this is the cost estimate just ballooned way more than certainly uh, any of us on the commission first thought at $35,000 float, I think about twice as much as we initially thought. And there's many factors that go into that. The anchoring system, the new anchoring system, the C-Flex system is patented and is relatively expensive. Uh, the engineering to hold, for, to really build a, a float that's going to hold in all weather conditions that we're really comfortable from an engineering standpoint, that a couple of big boats at 50,000 pounds would stay together on, drove the cost up. Uh, there's an installation cost, uh, contingencies, uh, the engineering cost is, was built into the cost above at 20000 to design and prepare the bid package, et cetera. And then one, there's one company that's doing sea line deterrence, and that's pretty pricey as well. Um, but nonetheless, I guess it's a, the most successful deterrent yet that allows you to get on the dock, not like some fence that you see some places where it just sort of makes the dock really tough to approach. Brad? But those things drove up the cost, Yes. Here's an example of, of the product that he's talking about. Um, um, many docks in the harbor and boats put this on, um, on their docks, and um, it would look similar to this in four-foot segments, and it would go around. It was envisioned that it might go around the perimeter of the float, so it wouldn't be all over the float, but it, was just, it would deter the sea lions from jumping up. If I can mention um, one thing about this slide, is that you'll notice that there's there's twenty thousand dollars, and this is well. First of all, I might back up. This is a very conservative estimate. 
there's a lot of there's a lot of play built into these numbers yet because we've we've opened it up to wood, concrete, aluminum, fiberglass, any sort of dock that someone would like to bid on. So we don't know what those numbers are. But really the um, the fixed cost is just the engineering for twenty thousand dollars, which um, for designing the the the, the program. And then the council may decide, well, every other cost is variable depending on how many you would like. So we chose six, but it could very well be three. It could be two. It could be four. It could be any number. So you just do the math. So I just wanted to put that um, $248,000 number in perspective. We're only recommending six because it was a good even number and three and three with the different anchoring systems. So uh, to, to get close to wrapping this up, to give you an overview, it's important to remember the initial thrust of this was to provide more service, uh, sort of providing uh, services to make the moorings more valuable to the lessees. And in view, you know, their rents have gone up, uh, but that really doesn't factor into this. It's more um, the boats sometimes are, they're difficult to use uh, because you get out there and the wind's blowing and to get off and on, it's, it's hard, although some Mooring per permittees feel it's not a problem. So we, we need to get a better sense of it, and I think it's important to uh, show that, uh, to, get, to get some idea of how it would, it would really work. The other side of it is, if it's done piecemeal, if we do the, do the test and we decide to move forward and put out docks out there, it really doesn't work because you'll never get to where you can shrink the mooring fields. It's almost as if you really need to say, all right, we're going to implement this program in an entire mooring field and have the docks go in so the whole thing shrinks. Uh, but you can't forget there are many mooring permittees that that is a hardship for them. They don't have the resources, nor do they have the desire to be on a dock and be pulled close together. So how we handle that is the important part of this. It's the nexus. And one option might be to say, okay, H&J, who wants to select for a dock and who would like to remain on a mooring. And you could rearrange those mooring fields so people will stay in their same field and then create a, uh, perhaps at the top of the field, have three or four rows of floats all close together and then have the moorings behind. And we believe that over time you would wind up with, with all docks at a certain point. But it's real important to, to we feel, to give options to the mooring permittees to move this forward. And we're talking outside the, the, the uh, trial here. This is, would be going forward. Brad, in, in your meetings, um, obviously they're, they're, uh, the mooring association's web survey was pretty negative. But the people that have come uh, that have volunteered, are they enthusiastic about it or is it like, well, we'll try it? I mean, I haven't gotten the sense that there's a real – burning desire among the current holders for this. But is that just because we haven't maybe reached an, a, a wide enough field? Or what is your sense of that? Well, I think the majority of attendees or permittees are members of the Newport Mooring Association. Uh, and we, but we've had a couple of them offer their moorings for the trial. And a couple have said they would be interested in doing it. We've had random, through the media, random people call Chris, myself, and say, I'd like to participate in the trial. I think it's a great idea. So it's not really an answer to your question. I think uh, the trial would help generate that answer. But I do agree with you from the standpoint, um, there's been no hue and cry to do this. And I think that's an important thing to understand. I think left alone, uh, people aren't going to abandon their moorings any faster than they are now and turn them back to the city or sell them or, or, or whatever. I think it's just on the part of the mayor and certainly on the Harvard Commission, we want to look at every aspect of some way to deliver more value to the permittees within reason and something they want and need. And one thing that came out of this was a facility, a dock, someplace for them to be able to wash down their boats and charge batteries, and so we need to work on that for sure. That's, uh, we'll, we'll move forward on that in the next year is one of our objectives. Brad, did you uh, contact any of the, um, the, the land side property owners in terms of their thoughts on, uh, on, right. on this, the, the reason I ask is I know that when we did the dredging on the on the channel there by uh, by Basin Marine between Balboa Island and Beacon Bay, I was approached by a lot of people saying, "Do you really have to put those uh, 
put those moorings back in because they like they like the open water feeling yes. of it. But then I looked at the one diagram that you did, and what you're doing is you're going to be concentrating things, so you're going to be creating open water in front of some houses and creating I mean, concentrations and in front of others. And I'm just right. wondering if that's going to start causing us some problems. I I don't. Obviously, there'll be some homeowners that just won't like it, but in most cases, uh, like on the channel between Babel Island and the mainland, it increases the views for everybody as far as, I, you know, it's pulling the boats closer to the center of channel. In the biggest mooring field we have, H and J, it concentrates them at the far end off Marina Park, and it pulls them away from Lido Island where the homeowners are. So it's, the, it's really, it creates a lot more water in front of Lido. But that's not to say we wouldn't hear from people. That it, it certainly is a consideration, and that's one of the considerations against pilings. Yeah, well, that was one of the things I, I remember when we, when the, I guess there was some newspaper coverage or something, that there were a couple of emails from people on the waterfront very concerned about their views. And then there, the other concern was, are we going to be creating more water quality issues because people are going to be doing more things on their boats, and we're not going to have as much control, perhaps. So that was also an issue. I know that the Dr. Skinner had been concerned about that. It was something just to consider down the road. Commissioner Avery, the <clears throat> one float is two boats? Right. Or okay. it could be there's no – we could do a 50-foot float, and it could accommodate theoretically four 25-foot But foot the boats. cost of that float would be greater than the 35000 Yes, I'm not sure. So if, no, if, the, I take, if I take roughly 550 boats – and apply these costs to provide for an entire mooring field for all of the boats. It's Eight, about ten million, million seven hundred fifty thousand. I got nine point six million. Mm -hmm. Nine point six million dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now the um, <clears throat> just so you know the of, of which there is a regular income, which is the mooring. Right. The the moorings currently. My question is, what's the benefit to the mooring holder for the cost of $9.6 million? mooring holder would have the same expense that they have today under, under what I proposed, uh, no increase, and the value would be the, the ease of, of anchorage, if you will. In my as simple as mind, well as, as well as water, if we get water to the Well, I think that we have to be clear here that at least in your initial proposal, it has never been the idea that the, all of the moorings would be That's correct. on docks. Correct. Uh, that we would always have the, the, just people who wanted that. Yep. However, I'm just, I'm just, before we go through, I'm thinking that before we really plunge into this, wouldn't it make sense for the city to do a survey of all the that's an option to do it beforehand. And just get, yeah. I mean, you could really do a good one that said, would you like it if it had this, if it had that, and, and options right. to just see. Because there may sure. be 10 or 20 percent of the people out there who really would like to do something like this, and that really then makes spending a quarter of a million dollars worthwhile as a test. But if, we, if it comes back and there's still 11 people <laughs> that even seem interested, well, right. uh, I, I would, I'd like I would to, agree with that. I would also yeah. say that, that we keep focusing on, on – uh, uh, service to the mooring people, there's two goals here. One is to make more water available for use. So to me, the survey is broader than just people that own moorings. If, if the mooring permittees were happy with going and, and doing, we could do the whole harbor, it would be a huge change in the harbor in terms of more open water. It would be dramatic everywhere. It would be really a plus. Um, I think the, we, we, the committee thinks that the best way to approach this is to is to perhaps do a survey first, um, but regardless, to respect the mooring permittees, to allow them, regardless of what happens, to select not to participate, and let if it's valuable, let people sign up for that. And then the docks should be funded by the people that sign up for it. And you could do that by adding, like on a 50-foot float, you could add 1500 bucks a year to the permit. They're, paying, they're going to be paying 3000 now. So 4500 a year, and you'd pay it off in 13 years if you want to throw in, you know, some interest or whatever. Well, I, but, would, I would like to look at those numbers, but that was not my intent. Yeah, right. My intent is, I think, for a city that focuses on the harbor as its greatest asset, uh, that uh, we should be willing to spend some money to right. make it a, a viable tool for those people that would prefer to have a dock to more to, but don't because of cost. Uh, uh, hello. Get it affordable. Yes. Yeah, we had We're down here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and and at the same time, uh, 
uh, make it more water available for recreational use. What would the left like to do? Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, Leslie. Well, the extreme left um, would uh, – <laughs> just kidding. Uh, mooring people – I mean, moorings are the, the last frontier for boating, and people aren't going down there for attached housing. And so what about sort of the independent spirit and the frontier of the mooring, swinging around on the boat and those types of things? I mean, you're a very uh, well-known experience in the harbor. I mean, do mooring folks – I mean, is that a legitimate – Sure. Absolutely. I think yeah. for, for a number of mooring permittees, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to have that. I think the flip side of it is, and I really don't have a bone here, I, I used to have a mooring and I enjoyed that, what you're talking about, just having space around you, which in this town is hard to find. But they don't, the mooring permit doesn't give them the right to have it. It's just for the mooring. And the water belongs to everybody. So I think that's, there is a loss. There's a cost, no question about it. And if I had, a, there's a number of people out there that are liverboarders, I think they do like to have the space around them. But it, the, the dock situation is no worse than any dock at Irvine Company Marina or anywhere else that are all six feet wide. So oh. they would just be joining the crowd. Here's the thing. I mean, we shouldn't enter into this with the idea that every single mooring in in the harbor is going to get switched over to a a fixed mooring. There will be, I think, if we're going to do a survey, it needs to be carefully done. We need to make it clear that we're not entering into this to convert all of our moorings, that people will be offered the opportunity to choose one or the other. And And I think... Because there is a public benefit associated with this idea, the public benefit being opening up the harbor for the benefit of all harbor users, um, uh, it seems to me that, you know, the city ought to bear, you know, as at least a substantial portion, I don't know, maybe all the cost. Um, but I think this survey should take the cost factor out of it. I think what you're trying to identify is the desirability of these moorings, of of these docks, these floating docks, as opposed to a free, uh, you know. A, a right. So um, I, th- this survey would need to be very carefully structured so that the hot-button issues are made clear to people and they're not voting on emotion and hot button issues they're voting on you know an objective all you know discourse of what the alternative is and you know frankly i i uh, i don't think the desires of the mooring holders should be the final determinant of what we do here because there is a public benefit associated with this that we need to think about too and if there's going to be alternatives to have a point system, uh, a mooring on a point system, or a mooring on a on an anchored dock, um, I don't think we need to be commanded by what the mooring holders think. I think we should do a survey to identify the level of interest in participating in this. Um, but I'm I'm in favor of the mayor's initiative here, and I'm in favor of finding out more about this and and doing a. Um, a trial on this because of the the public benefit here. Would you uh, comment more on on the concept that you shared of of putting something in the water before the survey was done? What discussion took place only on from that? the standpoint of people being able to see it, and and particularly to achieve uh, close, holding the docks closer together, you need to to put the C flex mooring system in and see that work. But I don't, you know, it's just a question of whether the, and I understand it's a lot of money, so perhaps a survey would be better. It's up to the council. But doing it a year into it might give people more a sense of what we're talking about. But I think the uh, a fear is, regardless, there's sort of a distrust amongst some mooring permittees that regardless if the city spends the money on the docks, they'll look to recoup it on the backs of the mooring holders. So that would keep, I think, will turn someone who would say, yeah, if you gave me a, a float for free, I'll take it. But if you're going to charge me X, I don't want it. But there will be a subset that will say, it's for me, like personally, when I had my boat out there, I gave up my mooring because I literally could not use it. I could not get the boat tied up to the dock. 
and maybe to and so, yeah, so the extra tying, tying tying up on a point mooring is, is pretty darn hard to do unless you got two people on the boat. <laughs> it is yeah exactly right. And if the wind is off either side of the boat, it, it's very difficult. Now, if you don't use your boat much, if you just live aboard and you don't go out, it's not an issue. But if you're an active user, it's an issue. Well, that's the other point. How many live aboards do we have in the harbor? Forty. No, we have about um, 20 permitted liveaboards. Okay. How many of those are mooring holders? All of them? All of them. So we're, we're talking about 20 people here that are liveaboards. The rest of the mooring holders, they don't spend all day out there on their mooring. I mean, you know, people come and go. They go out there, they use their boats, and they come back, and they put it on the mooring, and they go back, you know. So I don't want to be commanded by what the liveaboards think about this either because they're going to have an alternative to have a point system if they want it. I'm not worried about them. So Yeah, I think as long as we uh, if we're able to provide the same same uh, situation for them, that do, their situation doesn't change, um, and we can still put in docks, I think it's, it's good for everybody. So. Well, I think the survey can flush that out. You say, would you participate in this if you have to pay, or would you participate in this if the city pays? I mean, mm-hmm. those are the kinds of questions you'd Could do that. You'd ask. Sure. Brad, we, we may have one yeah. or two more we've talked about. <laughs> oh, um, uh, the last bullet point on this slide would be um, what we do after the project, and these are just questions to answer later on. Um, this just gives a brief time frame of how long. Look, we didn't anticipate going to the survey route today, so this, does, this slide doesn't take this into account. So assuming we were going to go forward today, you know, we could just ballpark six months to to implement after you put everything out to bid and so on and so forth. So that just gives the council an idea of how long it would take. And that's it. All right. Any further comments from the council? Well, I'd just say that I, I, I support going and doing the survey and just getting a little bit more information on this. Um, We, we could we could report um, back to you um, near the end of summer September you know give us 30 60 days to develop and put out a survey and uh, get some responses back and we we could work on that this summer probably September is more realistic I would say in the next four weeks but uh, I seem to operate on a different timeline than the... sure I think you did a great job. I thank uh, the Harbor Commission. I'm so impressed in the work the Harbor Commission has been doing this year. Uh, and um, uh, you guys are treating this like it was a full-time job, and uh, it's appreciated. Well, thank you. Yeah. And I, I would just like to thank the, the council for supporting uh, a harbor a harbor-related issue like this. I think it's a, it's a real opportunity uh, for all harbor users. And I'd like to thank the Newport Mooring Association. They showed up at every meeting, gave us a lot of input, gave us their concerns are important to us uh, and maybe trying to drive some mutually beneficial arrangement for for everybody. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public that would like to comment on this? Thank you. Thank you, um, Mayor Hill. My name is Norman Von Herzen. I've been a mooring owner for over 50 years, a mooring lessee or Permittee, I guess, is the proper term. And um, the concept that this would increase the value of my mooring or anybody else's, I think, is folly. Since, um, anyway, I think it's a public health danger as well. And the reason I say that is that um, if we look at the buoy, at the entrance channel of Newport Harbor, I noticed that um, there's at least one layer of sea lions and seals on that buoy at all times, and it's more likely a double layer. And these um, protected animals are um, anxious to find some place to haul out. As um, this article from the log indicates, the marina at uh, Ventura had a, a genuine problem with this that can be looked at on the log if you wish to. Uh, the, um, the concept of putting a floating dock 
in the bay is a is a a genuine invitation for sea lions and seals to haul out and do their thing on the on the floating dock and by their thing I mean propagating and defecating and I look at some pictures that are available of sea lions that inhabit uh, floating docks and the defecation that they leave behind is a genuine public health concern and I would not like my child or grandchild to be swimming in the harbor 30 to 40 yards away from a floating dock. The other, another consideration is the liability issue. And I believe I'm correct, I stand to be corrected, however, that if my present mooring breaks away in a storm, as moorings do from time to time in the harbor, either by dragging their weights or breaking the chain or the line, and there's a, a loose cannon, so to speak, if my boat damages another boat or any public property, I am responsible. I'm liable. But if you folks go ahead with this plan <clears throat> and install floating docks as securely as they're anchored, they're going to be a liability. And I believe the liability at that point will switch from the individual permittee to the city. That's all I have to say. Thank you Thank for you listening. Thank you very much. Anybody else would like to speak on this topic? Please come on down. Mayor Hill, City Council. My name is George Hilkema. I've hastily put together a few thoughts on the subject of offshore moorings. And as I understand uh, your vision for this, Mr. Mayor, is that this these would constitute kind of an offshore community and that the overall smaller footprint for the mooring fields and it would do something to support mooring permit holders and that water taxi would be available to the shore and that there would be a pilot program. With respect to community, I've had a boat on the sea mooring field for 25 years. Many of the folks in this area know each other and provide mutual support in looking after our boats and providing occasional transportation to and from the dock. We try to leave our dinghies tied to the main vessel if we are going to be absent more than a few days and not clutter the Fernando dock. I don't see how offshore docks would alter or improve our community. Smaller footprint. At some time, the city may own all the moorings, at which point moorings can be changed to docks or moved about to suit any design plan. Presently, most permits are privately held. They will likely be held for a long time and often passed on to family members and subsequent generations. For recent surveys, very few mooring permit holders have expressed an interest in docks in the mooring fields. Availability of a few docks here and there will not allow for a smaller mooring field permit. Support mooring permit holders. The proposed pilot program for six or so offshore docks might be available to a few permit holders where their location works for the program at no additional cost over their present mooring permit fee. Several years ago, the city increased the permit fee with a gradual increase over five years, amounting in the end to a cost at three times what it had been. While the pilot program docks would be offered without additional cost, an expanded dock program would have to charge uh, to pay for the capital investment and maintenance of offshore docks. Such costs or some fraction of those costs would have to be paid for by the participating permit holders. Rough estimates for this cost by the multi-vessel mooring system committee were that it would double the cost for a permit holder. I would guess that the expense would make most previously interested permit holders lose interest quickly. Further, the pilot program would not include AC power and water, and to provide these services for each offshore dock in a larger program would increase cost and maintenance considerably. Offshore moorings have historically provided lower cost access to the harbor. <clears throat> water taxi service. 
I've had my boat in the sea mooring field for over 25 years. Boat owners in this field come and go at all hours with little predictable schedule, and it's hard to imagine that this coming and going could be served by a water taxi. The wait time for service, the cost, and the downtime for the service provider would make this way way too inconvenient and expensive for a cost-conscious permit holder. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else in the public that would like to speak on this topic? Let me say one more thing concerning weather. I'm in the sea field, and one winter we had 70-mile-an-hour winds, and my mooring dragged 50 feet. I don't know what that would mean for a dock with two boats on it. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Councilman. My name is Bill Moses, and uh, I'm on the NMA board, and I've had a mooring here for quite a long time. I just want to thank uh, Chris and Brad for doing a great job of taking up the mayor's uh, request to look at this uh, alternative system of, of uh, mooring boats in Newport. And we did uh, immediately put the – sorry, am I boring you, Mr. Selich? <laughs> Oh, I'm Anyhow, uh, we did survey our uh, membership, and they're they're quite active looking at our uh, website, and as are others. And there was no hue and cry, uh, Mrs. Gardner, as you suggest, to uh, replace the current system. And with all due respect to your request, it kind of seems to me like a, a government uh, solution looking for a problem where one doesn't really exist. And if you get out on the bay very much you will notice that if someone's using their boat and not on the mooring, you don't have a dock to look at. And I'm not sure how many, if Chris or Brad has done the math, what would the uh, square footage uh, be required to take to uh, install all of these docks, even on a, you know, 50% of the moorings? You'd be adding a lot of square footage that's always out there on the bay rather than a, a mooring being empty. And... Quite frankly, the moorings uh, are emptier now than I've seen them in decades. I'm not sure if that's because of the uh, increased price or people just certain can't afford boating as much as they used to be able to right now because of the economic conditions, but we're open-minded. We believe that there are some places that uh, there could be a benefit to having this uh, alternative system, and uh, some people probably are uh, enthusiastic about trying it, and I, I hope that you know we're able to, to give you a, a meaningful test. I do believe that you're uh, doing a survey first uh, sponsored by the city to all the mooring permit holders, not just those that happen to visit our website, would be a real effective way of, of measuring the uh, uh, viability of doing this. And, and Mr. Councilman Han, I'm uh, uh, complimented that you, that you uh, would, would state that you are at the command of the mooring owners, uh, owners here in, in Newport. I don't remember that being the case, but we want to work with the city, and uh, if there are places where it can be a benefit to uh, install these new systems, that's great. But uh, as uh, some of the council members uh, are aware, the mooring people are an independent group. We don't have any uh, uh, dominion over the bay. We want to share it with everyone, of course. But when there's no boat on a mooring, there's no dock there either. And people go through the moorings and buy the moorings and swim through them and paddle through them all the time. So I do appreciate your being deliberate about any future plans for uh, the uh, multi-vessel mooring system in Newport. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to speak on the topic? All right. Bring it back. Um, I think... At least I hear that it's logical to proceed with a survey. Um, I would uh, think that the survey should be broader than just the mooring holders, uh, because there is public benefit involved in this. I'm not sure where and how we would draw that line. Um, I think this needs to come back to the council for uh, an action item. Uh, no, I, th I think the direction's fine. Yeah, I think it should also include all the Bayfront property owners, too. We could probably design something that is uh, both from a mail out to individuals as well as just collects people's thoughts uh, who just want to participate in it on top of that. We can do and sort them that way. I mix them. All right. Thank you. Well, uh, we will move rapidly into our fourth uh, item. We have the Orange County Sanitation District with us. 
Um, as much interest as I have in the sanitation district as serving as an alternate on the board. Um, I own property within the sewer system. Within? Yeah. <laughs> uh, to clean it up. Yes. But um, Councilman Hen and myself, I believe, need to recuse ourselves from this discussion uh, as the discussion is going to be talking about construction in front of my home. So. Mayor, as you're on your way out and council members tonight, we have Jim Herberg. He's the general manager of the Orange County Sanitation District. Um, he's here tonight at your request to talk about current and future projects and specifically uh, one coming up with uh, Mariner's Mile and the replacement of the main there. Jim. Thank you, and uh, thank you, uh, members of the council here, uh, to have us uh, here this evening to talk about our important work uh, that continues in Newport Beach. Uh, over about the past 10 years, and I'm sure you've all noticed it, the Sanitation District has made a lot of investments in our uh, wastewater infrastructure here in Newport Beach. Uh, notably, four pump stations have been completely replaced. Those are old pump stations that were built in the late 1930s. And three uh, sewer lines uh, were rehabilitated or replaced. Uh, additionally, uh, about a year ago, maybe a little more than a year ago, um, and when these chambers were brand new, we came in and gave an information item presentation on a series of projects we call it the Newport Beach program that are coming up. Um, two of those projects uh, have begun construction. One of them is completed. Another one has significant progress. And we're about to uh, begin one in Coast Highway, which uh, there will be a lot of interest, a lot of potential impacts. Um, our staff is here tonight, our, our Director of Engineering, Rob Thompson. I'll have him come up in a moment and talk about uh, the projects coming up, uh, the uh, coordination that we've been doing with the city staff, uh, Public Works and others, and the outreach that we're doing uh, to the uh, potentially affected public. Um, we understand the sensitivity and the potential impacts, and, and we want to get these projects done in a way that's sensitive to the needs of the, the, of the public. But they are, it's important work, and we have to get it done. Uh, and so with that, I'll introduce Rob Thompson, our Director of Engineering, to come up here and talk about it in some more detail. And Dave, if we're getting, if we need to move quickly, I know you have some other items on the agenda, uh, we'll do that. Thank you, members of the City Council. Um, as Mr. Herberg pointed out, I'm Rob Thompson, Director of Engineering for Orange County Sanitation District. Orange County Sanitation District, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, our agency, uh, serves North Central Orange County. We serve 479 uh, square miles, uh, treat about 200 million gallons of sewage per day, uh, serve a population of 2.5 million, which is comprised of 21 cities, uh, three special districts, and the County of Orange. Um, each, each city and special district uh, provide a, an elected official to our board, and that's how we're governed. Our assets within the city um, are pretty substantial. In meeting and, and going through all our conversations with constructability, we've talked a lot about um, what we'll call Project 5-60, which is the green line um, going through PCH from uh, Bay Bridge all the way down. Hey, Rob, I apologize for interrupting. You should probably just jump to the project. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> the project, uh, can I speak about the program? Just very briefly, all the work we have been doing lately, we've been working um, on the Balboa Bay trunk. Uh, that has been completed as of last month. We're working in Dover to um, renew that sewer from, this, um, from the uh, Costa Mesa line all the way down to PCH. We are getting ready to start on construction on PCH between Bay Bridge and our Bitter Point pump station. That is actually two force mains. It's shown as one line, but there's a north and south force main. I'll talk in a little, little more detail about sequencing. Um, in the future, about a year from now, we intend to start construction work um, on Newport Boulevard from the Costa Mesa line all the way down to PCH. And then off in the future, we have the um, what we're calling our Project 619, the southwest Costa Mesa trunk, which will allow the city to abandon a pump station. Moving on. From a, from a visual standpoint, this is Project 560. It is the connection of our dual force mains. You'll see the two lines a little more clearly um, 
in the street, there's a north and a south that we call it. It connects the Bay Bridge pump station, <coughs> Rocky Point pump station, Lido pump station, and Bitter Point pump stations. All of Newport Beach's um, sewage, except for a tiny bit near the airport, comes through this system. This is our artery for sewage flow, just like it's a traffic artery through the city for the very same reason. This is the only um, east-west passage through the city. It dates back uh, many years. So our job is to renew it while it keeps running, and that is a challenge. So what we have is a complex series of pipes and pump stations along with a lot of restrictions that have been placed on us for the betterment of the city and, and the businesses especially. We understand that the uh, summer season is out of bounds. We've worked very closely with the city on understanding the limitations. We also understand the boat parade is an important event, and we're working very hard and have placed restrictions on our contractor um, in his sequencing around that event. In addition, we're trying to stay away from schools. We've given the contractor um, a limitation to stay away from certain intersections during school time. So when all that is done, what it amounts to is a very busy construction season, which kicks off July 7th this year for a very short segment, which is um, right you could help me out with the mouse so they can see it. A short segment which connects our Lido pump station to the northern force main. That will be a jack and bore uh, methodology, so there will be two pits dug. The only traffic impact will be the loss of one lane in Old Newport, southbound, um, to accommodate that pit. But as soon as the Labor Day weekend passes, we intend to um, start some lane closures in Pacific Coast Highway. That will involve... Um, basically the stretch from Dover on um, toward New Newport Boulevard. The issue there is that while we have two force mains, they are not the same size. So this is one of those limitations in hydraulics that we're limited to as well as timing. We need to upsize and renew that south force main so that we can work on the north force main in series. So what that means is and at the city's uh, suggestion, instead of replacing the South Force Main, we are going to leave the South Force Main in place and the North Force Main in place through that area and do an open cut. So we're going to dig a, a trench and put both lines, brand new um, HDPE pipe, which will last 50 years, in the middle of the street, which will allow the businesses to stay open while we um, put in this critical infrastructure. There will be um, lane restrictions during the day, especially. Uh, there will be one westbound lane and two eastbound lanes at the, um, n when the contractor is not working and to the greatest extent they don't need to take those lanes, there will be two lanes open in each direction for that period from, yes. Hours. They start, what time when they start in the morning? Yes, they will start work about uh, 8.30, I believe, and end at 4.30. So we're trying to miss the peak. We are working with our contractor for um, ideas and suggestions they have to improve their schedule, to keep working. But it is a very complex operation. It's a lot of work, and we are committed to, to meeting our uh, commitments to the city and the motoring public, which we also um, support. I know time is short. Our, our pitch is we do a lot of work. We've done a lot of work in the city. We've renewed um, A Street Pump Station, 15th Pump Station, 15th Street Pump Station, Lido Pump Station, Bitter Point Pump Station, and Rocky Point Pump Station in the last uh, 14 years. We've um, replaced three different sewer segments. We're very accustomed to working in the city and minimizing our impact. However, this, this is the artery for both of us, and it's going to be difficult. We are committed to reaching out. That's who built it. Um, we are committed to reaching out. We have hired a firm to help us reach out to all the businesses um, along the um, stretch of Pacific Coast that we will be impacting. We are using uh, message boards, email, websites, mailers, direct contact with residents, er everything we can do to inform to the greatest extent possible. So I know time is short. I had more to say, but I'll...
Yeah, Rob, <clears throat> pardon me, Rob. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for, and uh, the rest of your team, for taking the time to come out here. This is a very important project for us. Um, and this is one of those, those improvements that aren't glamorous. Uh, you know, it's not a shiny new building, but this is vitally, critically important to the quality of life in Newport Beach. All we need is one catastrophic sewage spill into the bay or on our beaches, and that will have not only an environmental impact, an economic impact, uh, impacts that just resound through the community. So I applaud you for the foresightedness here. Having said that, it, this is one of those uh, necessary nuisances, and you know you have been generous with your time and the team to meet with us. Uh, we need to make sure that this type of message gets out to the people of Newport Beach in this arena, in the number of arenas that we've already talked about, so that they understand what's about to come, and to have this be as efficient as a construction project as can possibly be so that the disruption is minimized to the greatest extent. But I appreciate the fact that this infrastructure is going in. This is a long-term benefit to our community. Tara, will you also see that the neighboring cities get a lot of heads-up information so maybe they can take detours? <laughs> Uh, Rob, can you give an estimate about the total cost of the sanitation district investments going on in the city that have gone on in recent years and are going on currently and, and in the future year? Uh, we were just totaling that up uh, amongst ourselves over there, and it's in excess of $100 million. $100 million. I think it's, that's very important. We have close to 100-year-old infrastructure in Newport Beach, and this is critical to the ongoing maintenance of the city and, and the preservation of the quality of life in the city and the protection of the bay because that's where the sewage would end up in the event that we had a catastrophic failure. This is all being funded by a fee that's more or less, it was $14 a year, about a buck, buck 15 a, a month uh, that's, uh, that's being charged to pay for all of this. So I think Newport Beach certainly is getting its money's worth for that fee. Thank you. Well, this, this is a necessary project, as Councilman Petros said, the thing that I'd like to emphasize is traffic control. Um, everybody that's done a project down here, in my opinion, has bungled it. And the problem is they don't put up the traffic control warning devices early enough, and the next thing you know, you're, you're trapped. And I think it's really important that uh, you don't wait to put a traffic control device on the bridge before you get to Dover. Put something back on the other side of Jamboree so that people have more options to travel around there because it, it does become a big inconvenience, and there's nothing more frustrating to people to find that they've passed the last opportunity to uh, go around it. So I'd really encourage you to be really sensitive about that because if you take a look at the map of the city, it's uh, one of two ways you can get across the bay here. We agree. We have exactly the same uh, flow problem. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any public comments on this? Okay. Seeing none, public comments on... Uh, Non-agenda items. Okay. Mr. City Attorney, he left. Doesn't he make a little announcement? Uh, can I? I'll make it for him. Yeah, you make it for him because I don't know what to say. The City Council will adjourn to closed session to discuss agenda items 4, A and B, including one, meeting with Labor Negotiators Dave Kiff and Terry Cassidy regarding labor negotiations with all represented employees and... <laughs> Picked the wrong time to leave, Aaron. Yeah, I was trying to get the mayor back, but <laughs> meeting with legal it's counsel. It's a coup. It's a coup. We're taking over. <laughs> and meeting with legal counsel to discuss the lawsuit filed uh, by the city of Newport Beach against Banshee Construction. Okay, we're adjourned to closed session. <laughs>